<laughs> Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases, especially written, for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Dan Novak, John Russell, and Brian Lynn. Later, we will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, Here is Dan Novak. The United States Supreme Court has again placed itself in the middle of America's most divisive issues. Last week, the nation's highest court agreed to hear a case on the admissions policies of Harvard University and the University of North Carolina. The two universities use race as one of many things they consider in admissions decisions. A ruling against the universities, however, could seriously damage affirmative action. Affirmative action is a practice or policy of helping individuals belonging to groups known to have been discriminated against previously. It is a policy long criticized by conservative Americans. The court has already reviewed cases looking to restrict abortion rights and expand gun rights. Both are major goals of conservatives. The court's rulings on abortions and guns will come in June, and a ruling in college admissions is expected next year. The court has become more forceful since the addition of Justice Amy Coney Barrett. She was the third conservative justice nominated by former President Donald Trump. Barrett's seat gave the nation's highest court a 6 3 conservative majority and changed its balance of power. This particular six justice majority seems willing to push ahead in an aggressively conservative direction on multiple fronts, said Elizabeth Wydra. She is president of the liberal group Constitutional Accountability Center. She added that the majority is ignoring the ideas of judicial restraint and stare decisis. Judicial restraint leaves policy making decisions. To the executive and legislative branches of government. And stare decisis is the legal belief of respecting past court rulings. Observers say that based on oral arguments from a case brought by the state of Mississippi last year, the court's conservatives seem prepared to weaken or even overturn the 1973 Roe v. Wade decision. The Roe v. Wade ruling. Effectively legalized abortion in the U.S. The court also appeared ready to rule against a New York state law that limits the right to carry guns in public. Others say the court's willingness to hear these cases is a sign of how the conservative majority is moving the court to the political right. Four justices are needed for the Supreme Court to hear a case. And it has at least that many who are not worried about being seen as politically motivated, said Joshua Wilson. He is a professor at the University of Denver and is an expert on conservative law and politics. Given the political appearance of the kinds of cases they hear, it's all the more remarkable given that they have to know how much the public is paying attention, Wilson said. The High Court's conservative majority has been critical of the power of federal agencies. The action could be described by conservatives as a war on the administrative state. The court, for example, this month blocked the Biden administration's COVID 19 vaccination or testing requirement for companies with at least 100 workers. The justices also heard two cases. Challenging environmental laws aimed at reducing air and water pollution. They did so even though Biden's administration asked them to wait while agencies write new rules. Ian Fine is a lawyer with the National Resources Defense Council Environmental Group. 
He said the court was incredibly aggressive in taking up the two cases. The court also seems to support religious rights. It has ruled in favor of religious groups challenging COVID-19 restrictions. And last week, the court heard a case from Maine that could expand public funding of religious groups. I'm Dan Novak. United States Army officer Khalid Shabazz is one of a very small number of American military chaplains who are Muslim. Colonel Shabazz is also the highest level Muslim chaplain in the U.S. military, says the Army Times newspaper. Although he has had great success, Shabazz has faced many difficulties in his life. A chaplain is a person who performs religious services and gives help and guidance to people. Shabazz serves as command chaplain for U.S. Army Central, the command responsible for land operations in the Middle East. With his position as a colonel, Shabazz is now responsible for tens of thousands of soldiers and supervises other chaplains. Like all military chaplains, he has to be ready to deal with soldiers of all religions. The majority of my job is counseling about domestic issues or other kinds of difficulties, and only one percent of my job is actual religious counseling, Shabazz explained. Still, in order to better understand Christian soldiers who make up the majority of the military, Shabazz continued to study Christianity. He even got a doctorate in Christian theology from North Texas Theological Seminary. Shabazz became a Muslim as a young man. He believes his experience with both religions has helped to make him a better chaplain. Shabazz has had success despite difficult times in the past. As a child, Shabazz was sexually abused by a family friend, an experience, he said, that left him an angry young man. When he first went to college, he said, he became friendly with the wrong crowd. He began drinking alcohol and partying and often found himself in violent disagreements. It was during one of these drunken fights that he was beaten and shot in the back. He survived but decided to put his studies on hold. He went back to Louisiana, his home state. The only job he could find was as a cleaner at a large store. With few choices available to him, Shabazz joined the military. It was there he first read the autobiography of Malcolm X. I found a lot to inspire me in his story, said Shabazz. He added, I wanted to be educated and to stand for something bigger than myself, so I decided to become like Malcolm. Shabazz's new identity as a Muslim came in the early 1990s. The change was not received well by all. He faced discrimination from other soldiers and the displeasure of his Christian family. He was ready to quit the military. Then he met with an army chaplain. The officer persuaded Shabazz not only to stay in the army, but to become a chaplain himself. Shabazz became a chaplain in 1998, having studied Arabic in Jordan along the way. He also earned two master's degrees at universities in Connecticut and California. Shabazz says there are five Muslim chaplains in the Army, three in the Air Force, and one in the Navy. Shabazz added there is more work to be done. Unlike other faiths, Shabazz said, he has not met any Muslim chaplain assistants, officers who help chaplains in their work. But, he said, it's easier today to be a Muslim soldier in the army than when I began. I'm John Russell. Facebook's parent Meta says it has created a powerful supercomputer 
that it expects to be the world's fastest when it is completed later this year. The company recently announced the computer will be used to create better artificial intelligence models and to improve operations that process huge amounts of data. Supercomputers are made up of hundreds or thousands of powerful machines. They work together to perform complex operations that are not possible with normal computing systems. Meta's supercomputer is currently operating. The company calls it the AI Research Supercluster, or RSC. In a statement, the company said RSC will help Meta's AI researchers build better AI models that can learn from trillions of examples. The company did not provide information on where the computer is kept or how much money is being spent to build it. An AI system can be trained to recognize different kinds of content and perform actions examining huge amounts of data. Such systems require very powerful computers. Meta said its supercomputer will be able to process written information, images, and video that is in hundreds of different languages. Meta said the computing system can process images and video up to 20 times faster than current systems. The company is expected to use the system for its Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp services. The company said it believes RSC is currently one of the world's five fastest supercomputers. It said RSC would become the fastest when it is fully operating. In addition, Meta said it hopes RSC will help in the development of completely new AI systems. One example is a planned tool that would permit real-time voice translations to large groups of people interacting in business or social situations. Such an operation fits with Meta's stated goal of developing technologies to be used in a future metaverse. Metaverse is a term used to describe a non-physical world in which individuals interact through different kinds of digital technology. Meta chief Mark Zuckerberg wrote in a Facebook message, The experiences we're building for the metaverse require enormous compute power, quintillions of operations a second. Meta uses a combination of human moderators and AI to identify and remove what it considers harmful content and misinformation. Some critics say the company is not doing enough to block bad content. It has also faced government scrutiny over its privacy and business methods in the United States and Europe. In a statement, the company said its supercomputer will be helpful in critical use cases like identifying harmful content. Diego Naranjo is the head of policy for European Digital Rights. It is a group of non-governmental organizations seeking to restrict the power of large technology companies. He told the French press agency AFP that he recognizes Facebook has made some efforts to protect users' privacy 
and limit harmful content. But he questioned what the company might do with such a powerful new tool. Nothing good can come from all that computer power in the hands of such a tech superpower, Naranjo said. Meta said its supercomputer will use real-world examples from its own systems during the process to train its AI. They are going to, for the first time, put their customer data on their AI research computer, said Thomas Sandholm. He is a computer science professor and co-director of the AI Center at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. Sandholm said it marked a really big change for Facebook to give its AI researchers and computing systems access to all that data. Meta said the data used to train AI models will go through a privacy review process to ensure that it is not linked to individual users. It added that the data will also be encrypted before entering the training process. I'm Brian Lynn. Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. After the end of World War I, President Woodrow Wilson sought national support for his idea of a League of Nations. He took his appeal directly to the American people in the summer of 1919. Tony Riggs and Frank Oliver continue the story of Wilson's campaign. The plan for the League of Nations was part of the peace treaty that ended World War I. By law, the United States Senate would have to vote on the treaty. President Wilson believed the Senate would have to approve it if the American people demanded it. So he went to the people for support. For almost a month, Wilson traveled across America. He stopped in many places to speak about the need for the League of Nations. He said the League was the only hope for world peace. It was the only way to prevent another world war. Wilson's health grew worse during the long journey across the country. He became increasingly weak and suffered from severe headaches. In Wichita, Kansas, he had a small stroke. A blood vessel burst inside his brain. He was forced to return to Washington. For a few days, President Wilson's condition improved. Then, his wife found him lying unconscious on the floor of his bedroom in the White House. Wilson had lost all feeling in the left side of his body. He was near death. The president's advisors kept his condition secret from almost everyone. They told reporters only that Wilson was suffering from a nervous breakdown. For the next few days, the medical reports from the White House were always the same. They said Mr. Wilson's condition had not changed. People began to wonder, were they being told the truth? Some people began to believe that the president was, in fact, dead. Vice President Thomas Marshall was worried. If the president died or could not govern, then he, Marshall, would become president. But even Vice President Marshall could get no information from Wilson's doctors.
After several weeks, the president seemed to get a little stronger. He was still very weak. He could not work except to sign several bills. This simple act took most of his strength. Wilson's wife, Edith, guarded her husband closely. She alone decided who could see him. She alone decided what information he could receive. All letters and messages to Woodrow Wilson were given first to Edith Wilson. She decided if they were important enough for him to see. Most, she decided, were not. She also prevented members of the cabinet and other government officials from communicating with him directly. Mrs. Wilson's actions made many people suspect that she, not her husband, was governing the country. Some spoke of her as the nation's first woman president. There was one issue Mrs. Wilson did discuss with her husband, the League of Nations. The Senate was completing debate on the Treaty of Versailles. That was the World War I peace agreement that contained Wilson's plan for the League. It seemed clear the Senate would reject the treaty. Too many senators feared the United States would lose some of its independence and freedom if it joined the League. The leader of Wilson's political party in the Senate, Gilbert Hitchcock, headed the administration campaign to win support for the treaty. He received Mrs. Wilson's permission to visit her husband. Hitchcock told the president the situation was hopeless. He said the Senate would not approve the treaty unless several changes were made to protect American independence. If the president accepted the changes, then the treaty might pass. Wilson refused. He would accept no compromise. He said the treaty must be approved as written. Senator Hitchcock made one more attempt to get Wilson to reconsider. On the day the Senate planned to vote on the treaty, he went back to the White House. He told Mrs. Wilson that compromise offered the only hope for success. Mrs. Wilson went into the president's room while Hitchcock waited. She asked her husband, Will you not accept the changes and get this thing settled? He answered, I cannot. Better a thousand times to go down fighting than to surrender to dishonorable compromise. <laughs> The Senate voted. Hitchcock's fears proved correct. The treaty was defeated. The defeat ended Wilson's dream of American membership in the League of Nations. Mrs. Wilson gave the news to her husband. He was silent for a long time. Then he said, I must get well. Woodrow Wilson was extremely sick, yet he was not the kind of man who accepted opposition or defeat easily. From his sickbed, he wrote a letter to the other members of the Democratic Party. He urged them to continue debate on the League of Nations. He said a majority of Americans wanted the treaty approved. Wilson probably was correct about this. Most Americans did approve of membership in the League of Nations. But they also wanted to be sure membership would not restrict American independence. The Senate Foreign Relations Committee agreed to reopen discussion on the treaty. It searched yet again for a compromise. 
It made new efforts to get Wilson to accept some changes. But, as before, Wilson refused. He was a proud man, and he thought many of the senators were evil men trying to destroy his plan for international peace. Wilson's unwillingness to compromise helped kill the treaty once and for all. The Senate finally voted again, and the treaty was defeated by seven votes. The treaty was dead. The United States would never enter the League of Nations. And one of the most emotional and personal stories in the making of the American nation had ended. The long battle over the Treaty of Versailles ended with political defeat for Woodrow Wilson. Yet, history would prove him correct. Wilson had warned time and again during the debate that a terrible war would result if the world did not come together to protect the peace. Twenty years later, war came. The First World War had been called the War to End All Wars, but it was not, and the Second World War would be far more destructive than the first. The debate over the Treaty of Versailles was the central issue in American politics during the end of Woodrow Wilson's administration. It also played a major part in the presidential election of 1920. Wilson himself could not be a candidate again. He was much too sick. So the Democratic Party nominated a former governor of Ohio, James Cox. Cox shared Wilson's opinion that the United States should join the League of Nations. He campaigned actively for American membership. The Republican Party chose Senator Warren Harding as its candidate for president. Harding campaigned by promising a return to what he called normal times. He said it was time for America to stop arguing about international events and start thinking about itself again. The two presidential candidates gave the American people a clear choice in the election of 1920. On one side was Democrat James Cox. He represented the dream of Woodrow Wilson. In this dream, the world would be at peace, and America would be a world leader that would fight for the freedom and human rights of people everywhere. On the other side was Republican Warren Harding. He represented an inward-looking America. It was an America that felt it had sacrificed enough for other people. Now it would deal with its own problems. Warren Harding won the election. The results of the election shocked and hurt Woodrow Wilson. He could not understand why the people had turned from him and his dream of international unity and peace. But the fact was that America was entering a new period in its history. For a long time, it would turn its energy away from the world beyond its borders. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.